my gosh, there's so much happens in the seventh episode and there's so much to talk about between the stuff with the underworld and just within the show itself. Yeah, so Procrustes, I they totally changed the reason how he got there, um, which means that they also changed the entrance to the underworld completely because they completely got rid of the record studio idea that that is the entrance. And so they went into Procrustes knowing who he was already, knowing what his trick was going to be, and like not falling for it like they did in the books, which I mean, like, there definitely was a, a little bit that I think could have been funny with like Grover wanting to try out the massage bed and oh, like yeah, actually yeah. <laughs> for it. Um, but yeah, they just have him at the door peeking in at the end, like, is he gone? Like, are we good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't know, they, they changed so much in this one episode and they packed in like so many chapters from the book. And with Procrustes, um, I mean, his story is somewhat of a blank slate because there's not a lot there. What we know is that Theseus on his way to Athens, he met up with a bunch of different bad guys who he had to like use their own tricks on them. And so that was one of them. And it's very clearly what Percy does as well is like he puts him in his own bed. Um, the whole thing was he was a robber and he would like trick travelers into going into beds that um, were either always too small or too big for them. And it's basically like the Grimm Brothers Cinderella where it's like chopping off pieces if they're too tall or stretching them if they're too short. And um, in the book, Rick has every single bed is six feet. So um, Annabeth and Grover are being pulled while Percy is like having a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, like it, it, the other thing too that I noticed was the difference between book and show was he also acknowledges that that is his half brother in the show. Yeah. He doesn't acknowledge it at all in the books. And, um, I don't know who his mom is, but he is clearly more divine than Percy is mm -hmm. in a way. But yeah, he's definitely half brother. Yeah, I felt like the show version of Krusty was scarier yeah. than the book version. Like the book version, it was almost like he has OCD and mm -hmm. it is like everything needs to be exactly perfect. And the reason why he was killing people is purely just because he wants everything to be perfect. But yeah. the show version of him is creepy as hell. <laughs> um, like the way that he like touches Percy and he just looks so uncomfortable. You're just like, oh God, <laughs> like what is, what is he about to do to this kid? And so I like that the crusty version in the show is actually like scary. Like, not necessarily just, like, weird or whatever, necessarily, I guess. Um, I just like that scene of... I like every time that Annabeth uses her invisibility stuff to basically assist Percy. Because I like it when Percy gets assistance. <laughs> yeah. and, and it also just very nicely sets up her being there in the next episode during the Luke fight. But I always like when Annabeth gets they get to show more of her like protecting him because that is something that she does. But um, there's usually so much going on in the books that they don't focus on it as much. So I liked mm -hmm. seeing that, that even to the point that she is the one screaming at him when he's like, you'll never find your mom. And she's like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll like, don't make me come back out there and chop your head off. Like I'm assuming that Disney, wouldn't be okay with their 12 year old leads chopping somebody's head off so <laughs> that's probably why that didn't happen <laughs> um but yeah it was just an interesting distinction of how different that is and like and i could i could like literally picture in my mind like the t people like the writers and stuff being like we can't make an entire set just for like one scene and mm -hmm. it, since there's forty thousand things happening in this episode they just like shoved everything in one place because it's just, it's just, there's not enough time. <laughs> they yeah, have, they no, have to like, kind of do that. 
they should have had one more episode. I'm going to go on my rant about the, the whole Hades thing because mm -hmm. they really should have packed in one more episode. I really think so. There is a lot of character in Percy's interaction with Charon, and I think they still could have done it without doing the record studio. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we get this really short interaction with Charon where he's like, we're all dying to some extent. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I honestly love that how much it shows Percy's character, the argument he has with Charon, where um, he's like slowly bribing him more and more. And he's just like mm -hmm. really playing up this one thing that I, I found myself thinking about this when I did my Underworld video, because Charon is positioned between the people who haven't been buried, meaning they're not allowed to cross the person oh you know like it's a fully stationed there so who do you people who haven't been buried meaning they're not allowed to cross mm -hmm. and you know the actual real underworld he is literally the person always stationed there so who do you think he has to hear them moaning and yelling and screaming and wailing that they want to mm -hmm. be let across you mm -hmm. know like it's a very thankless job and percy plays on that so well he's mm -hmm. just like you know, you deserve a pay raise. Um, you're very, you're very useful and you do such hard work and like, you're not appreciated. And I would have loved to see Percy do some of that little subtle mm -hmm. manipulation. <laughs> that would have been fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah it really would have been nice if they had well. like one ish more episodes where they would have had more time to fit everything in like that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I mean, they even changed the the fields of um, Asphodel a lot, too, from the books. Mm -hmm. um, they gave them more meaning in the show. Uh, the books has it exactly right as to what they are. Um, it's basically a place where neutral people go, you know, like they don't want to risk judgment because they didn't do anything great. And mm -hmm. the idea of the underworld seems to almost hedge on military greatness to get into the Isle, the Isle of the Blessed, because like, you know, it's people like Achilles and Odysseus and like, you know, people who've done great military deeds. Mm -hmm. So if you're just a normal everyday citizen, have you really done enough to make your way over there? Um, and, uh, they they like attach regret to it, which I found a couple lines in some descriptions of the underworld where they say it's people with unfinished deeds. And uh, I guess that could in some ways be regret that you <laughs> regret not finishing something. Um, but yeah, they I feel like Disney kind of went a little more Christian with it because I mean, <laughs> studying classics, I my mom always thought me going to a Jesuit university would mean like I would get more religious because the religious background with it. Mm -hmm. But instead, it was like I saw the man behind the curtain, you know, mm -hmm. I, I saw how these different things got formed. So with the idea of the underworld, there kind of always was this idea that there's a good people place, a middle place and a bad place. Mm -hmm. um, but it develops as time goes on. And Virgil's kind of the one who's really talking about punishment in that way, which is why Dante builds upon that when he writes a Christian hell in the Inferno. So um, yeah, Disney kind of, it feels a little bit more Virgil than it does like, I guess Homer would be, you know, the other person that wrote the underworld, but he didn't really put a lot of detail because Odysseus mm -hmm. didn't even cross the ferryman. Um, so the thing, about, the thing about the fields of asphodel part where like annabeth gets stuck that i thought was f interesting is because it's funny because when you're like a fan of the book series and you know how everything is going to happen you don't like pick up or think about these things but they put in all of these li like little things in this episode to make you wonder like is grover the the mole or is Grover the one that's betrayed them or whatever is Annabeth the one that's betrayed them and I remember seeing like <laughs> every once in a while on here I would see like a video from someone who had never read the books and I was like oh my god and in a lot of those videos they thought that Annabeth was a lightning thief um because 
she gets stuck in the fields of asphodel and has a regret um and it like there are some people that thought maybe it was Grover because he lost like the pearl and they were like, did he lose it like on purpose? So they couldn't bring um, Sally home or something like that. Um, but I, I just thought like, I don't know if that's why they did it, but I feel like that might've been part of the reason why they set it up like that was purely to make you, to force Annabeth to leave early and make you wonder like right before the end, right before you find out that it's Luke, like, is she the one that's gonna betray Percy at the end? Which like, no, oh my God. <laughs> but there is a lot of people who thought that it was her, who had never read any of the books. They kind of just assumed that it was, her. there were some crazy people who thought that it was Sally. <laughs> children, children, can we calm down? Cause it's literal children usually thinking these things. And I was just like, children, oh my God, no, it's not, it's not Percy's mom. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> like Annabeth, that is the first thought you have when she starts getting mm -hmm. caught is like, what is that regret? Because even having read the books, I mean, I know I read them like a decade ago, but um, I definitely was like, I don't, what, wait, what is she regretting? I don't remember. And um, so, yeah, that definitely does sow a seed of doubt in her. And with Grover, I I feel like, yeah, me knowing the books probably tainted that because didn't he only have three pearls in the books? Like he never mm -hmm. had the extra pearls for Sally. Yeah, that was one of those funny things is I saw, after I watched the show, I saw a lot of posts or videos would come up on here of people that were upset about how they had like four pearls and they were like how do you have four already like that's everything with like the story is messed up if they have enough and rick riordan literally like posted <laughs> and to be like everyone calm down like it doesn't actually change like the story you'll see and it does i actually really liked that change because it they had hope for a while that things would turn out and then it gets taken away from them and so it feels worse for them to think for a second that they have enough to take Sally home. And then all of a sudden, when they're about to rock into the fields and stuff, be all of a sudden sitting there like, now we don't have enough to go home. So who is gonna stay here yeah. and and have to like go through that whole decision? Like they do that in the books too. Like uh, um, Annabeth and Grover both are like, want both basically fighting over which one gets to sacrifice themselves and stay and that's like a sweeter moment in the books because percy never tells them in the books that he he is told that somebody will betray him and so that's him finally realizing these people would never betray me and i've been worried about this all this time they would never do this to me um mm -hmm. and in the show version it's of course percy wanting to sacrifice himself again for the five millionth time and then being like no like sidebar to talking about this, but I saw a video com comparing the underworld, like this stuff um, with the the book and the show and the horrible movie the other day. And I don't remember this, but I guess in the lightning thief movie, when they're down there, they're just immediately like Grover's staying behind. Oh my God. <laughs> and they're immediately just like Grover's the one. Grover's just gonna stay here. Nobody, we're not even gonna have a discussion about this. He's just gonna stay. I'm like what? And like the video with like person who made the video was like, oh my god, what did Grover do wrong to you guys? Where you're just immediately like, yep, he's the one that's staying behind, and he might never get out of here <laughs> ever again. He's just gonna stay. And it's like, oh my god, like that's of course the movie doesn't care and is just like uh, gonna keep like the like disabled allegory character stuck in hell forever but um but anyway to go back to that like i that's what i liked about that is that they were sitting there having to think about it now like now we don't have enough people to go home so like what do we do and um that part with annabeth i really liked because percy is like scared because he mm -hmm. doesn't know what's gonna he doesn't trust that the pearls are even gonna work Mm -hmm. And now Annabeth has to use it. And it's like nice to hear an Athena kid be like, I trust your dad. Because yeah. like purely just because it's Percy's dad. That's the only reason why she does. But it's like a whole, you. Re it's a nice like kind of end of the journey moment where 
Annabeth is like Annabeth saying out loud that she trusts Poseidon at all. Um, and only just because it's Percy's dad and she wants to believe that he would help them. Um, because yeah, if, if those things don't work or she goes to the wrong place, everything is horribly messed up and there's nothing that they can do about it. Um, yeah. yeah what, my pet theory for what Annabeth is like, her regret or whatever is because the fun part about that is that they don't tell you and so it means that they can bring it up whenever they want later on and talk about it because it's not at all a thing in the books obviously um i've like wondered it could be her dad but her dad is a horrible human being so <laughs> i'm gonna go with that it's not her dad um i at least I don't want it to be her dad because I think it's more interesting if it's um, the whole prophecy thing again, that I just think it's because I could understand if that could be it to be like, okay, um, I know about this prophecy that Percy's supposed to die. And it's pretty obvious by this point that Percy is the prophecy kid. Like no matter what you think, he's doing all these things and figuring things out. So it's probably him. And so I like the idea of her being like, shit, <laughs> like I know about this prophecy that is about this kid's life and I'm really good friends with him now. Um, he's going to be really upset when he finds out that I know about this already and I never told him. Uh, mm -hmm. But I hated him a week ago, <laughs> so I didn't tell him then, but now he's going to be upset by it. And that makes me sad because I actually really like him that's like one of those weird things of like, that's a hard position for her to be in, to know something like that anyway. Like the gods are assholes for making the rule that they're not allowed to tell any of the kids that are like involved in the prophecy about it. Like they literally make a rule about that, <laughs> that they're not allowed to tell per like any of the big three kids about it. And that's like, that's really terrible <laughs> that they did that. But I could see it being that because I hate her dad and don't want her to feel guilty at all for anything she did around her dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I can see it being that too. Um, definitely like, oh shit, this kid could do a lot if I actually told him this. He might actually choose to do the right thing with this prophecy if I tell him that because she's already seen the type of hero he is multiple times over at this point in the show. Well, yeah, and it's hard, like, he doesn't, Percy by this point has shown that he doesn't like it when when he feels like things are being kept from him. And so it's that feeling of everybody knows about something, but I somehow don't know, but I'm the focus of it. That's, yeah. it's a in very intense, like scapegoaty feeling. That's like our entire lives. We just walk around feeling like that everywhere we go. Like I've never been in a situation, like a social situation where I don't feel like that at some point. It's so yeah. frustrating. And so it'd be one of those things of, I know this is going to hurt his feelings or make him upset when he finds out about it. And there is quite literally no way to tell someone, hey, there's a prophecy that says that you have to make a decision to save the entire world. And also you might die. <laughs> like, okay. That sounds great. I'm 12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, um, the other thing I really wanted to talk about with this episode is some of the mom crap. Because, like, I, I mean, you know, this, this week was hard for me as a mom. Self, I can't imagine what that feels like. Things like, like me, but what I can say, episode is some of the mom crap. Because, like, I, I mean, you know, this, this week was hard for me as a mom. And I won't talk about my, my kids' struggles in that way, but what I can say is when you have a child who is struggling and, like, you are by yourself i can't imagine what that feels like because after having this hard week you know my mother-in-law came over i was not on my own and having an extra person in the house alone was enough to help change things like you know back to a more positive way and um like the fact that sally has to do this alone and we see her desperately like grabbing for somebody's leftover milkshake to just talk to the father of her child like, I feel a little mad for her. I I mean, it's what what I just I don't know that I completely understand about Sally is that that is the moment where we finally see she's aware of the world. She's aware of like what Percy's going to go through and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't understand wanting to send him away. Uh, that would make me, maybe because I'm a helicopter, that would make me want to be closer. It would make me want to be like, well, you know, if I can in any way be around while this is happening, like even if I couldn't tell him because, you know, like telling him would open his eyes, wipe the, whist, the mist away and like, you know, like she says in the episode, next time it might not be a friendly, magical, like pretty thing that he sees because yeah. the first thing that he sees is a Pegasus. Um, I remember from reading through the books more that it's legitimately a situation that she doesn't have anywhere else for him to go. That's why he ends up going to like fancy academies and stuff is because they're the only schools that will take him. The other like normal public schools or whatever in the city won't take him at those ages. Be And this one almost doesn't take him because they try to like slap like the behavioral like problems label on him and be like he doesn't have any like mental health or disability problems this is just a behavior he's just a bad kid sort of thing and so it's purely a situation of no other school will take him because he, he i think i'm assuming anyway that the school that he got kicked out of before this one um they like reference it in the books but it's when they go to like an aquarium and he accidentally drops his entire class into an aquarium <laughs> Um, because he he doesn't know what he's doing. He has, you know, water powers, but he doesn't know that and he just does it accidentally. Um, but of course, people think that he did it on purpose and it just goes in line with him being a bad kid. And that on top of the fact that he's already been seen by a guidance counselor because they think that he's hallucinating, that he was out on like the roof staring at a creature that nobody else can see in the middle of school. Um, that, yeah, that's that's basically what's going on with Sally is that no other school will take him, but like this fancy, like more private academy who's supposed to have like specialized, you know, specialized programs or whatever, says that they will take him. And so it's like, this is the only option at that point. That was the only options that she really had. Like, he doesn't end up going in the second book he goes to a normal school for seventh grade like in the city but it's i remember that it's a school that is like far away from where they actually live like it takes them a while to get home um but other than that like the only other school he goes to like that is one that um paul like sally's next partner who's like a english teacher helps him get into that school otherwise I don't think he would be able to get in because they would just look at his record and see that he's been kicked out of like every school he's ever gone to. And the longest he's ever been at one is a year. And they think that he's a bad kid and think that he's done all these bad things. And then on top of it, he was on the news in this book. Um, yeah, that's true. And that whole thing is going on as well. Like there's times during the books where people are like, do I know you from somewhere? Like in the in this chapter that happens in other books and he just like lies his ass off about it because he <laughs> because then he realizes that people know him and think that he's this crazy kid um, from the FBI hunt when he was 12. Um, but that's part of like what's so horrible about those scenes is that Sally doesn't have anywhere else to go and she's just trying to find a place at this point where he could be safe for an entire year. And the idea of being at a school that's supposed to be more specialized makes her feel like he would be safer there and like farther away from the city. So there's like less people around and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can get why he would think that or like why she would try to go with that because there is that whole thing that you feel like if it's like a richer place that they somehow know more than you. Um, yeah. That's not true. Like, <laughs> I can, I can say that that's not true. Like I grew up in a, a very rich, small town. They had no fucking idea what they were ever doing. They were horrible when it came to like, especially neurodivergent disability things. They just tried to shove you into like the ED class or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, like I rem I went to those until I was in high school. Actually, I went to some of those when I was in high school too. 
because they were like you're really good at english but also you're so bad at math that you need to go to like remedial tutoring <laughs> and no one thought anything like oh maybe maybe there's something going on with her wiring <laughs> maybe you have this calculus no nope. No, nope. none of that. That I don't even remember that ever even coming up. Like my third grade teacher thought that I might have ADHD, mm. but that that was the only teacher that ever said anything like that. The school that I went to that had a lot of money, they didn't do anything like that. They just kind of I would just go to like the um, LD classroom to do like math specific tutoring all the time um, from like fourth grade through to like. I think the last time I did that was in 10th grade because I just took a class in 11th grade to finish math and then was done. And I was like, I'm never doing this ever again, except I had to do it in college one more time. But, um, but like I, but by that point I hated math so much that I just like, I remember in fourth grade, they literally had to bribe me with Jolly Ranchers to get me to try to do my homework because every time I tried to do it, I always did it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, at age nine, I was like, I'm tired of trying. <laughs> so this episode, the scenes with Sally, I never watch them because they are way too triggering for me. <laughs> like yeah. as Percy, I can't do it. I like can't watch them. There's, it was so hard watching them the first time that I'm like, I don't think I can like mentally get through this episode watching this again because it is like it's bad enough seeing the little parts of the scenes when i fast forward um it's like i i would die actually having to watch that again because it is so hard mm -hmm. it and i i like that they put those in there because it shows the reality of things that sally and other parents like sally have to go through because it's yeah. it's in the books, it's easier for Percy to just be like, well, I hate myself, literally. <laughs> That's basically what it is, is I hate myself and I'm a problem for everybody around me, but he plays it off in like a in like a humor way like we tend to do. And he doesn't really talk about it seriously. When he does bring it up, he makes it like a joke or whatever. But like, this is like the reality of what that would actually be like. And, ugh. The like, what is it? The the part when they're like at like the restaurant or whatever. Um, first off, when they're at the school and he hears his principal talk about him that way, um, that brought back like so many memories for me and I wish that I could delete them all. Um, because that happens so much when you're a kid like that. Like you just hear people talking about you in this way, like that that you're weird or different or strange and you're just like i'm sitting right here and yeah. you're talking about me like this and i can hear you and but you're acting like i'm not here right now you're acting like i'm invisible and i'm sitting here listening to adults just like discuss what's wrong with me as if i don't matter um it's just horrible it feels so horrible like i can't even count how many times that happened like my dad used to have conversations like that just complaining about me <laughs> to people to like family i remember going to the doctor and the doctor talking to my mom about how if i didn't if i stopped being so active with sports i would get fat and telling her to put me on a diet when i was william's age when i was 11 when i was in fifth grade and they were just, I remember doing that. They were just talking about all this stuff when I'm sitting right there. And that's not even counting the stuff with school that I was seen in guidance counselor when I was in fifth grade too. And the, because everything at my house was absolutely insane, they didn't, they didn't completely understand what was going on. They were always, I remember once, um, this is just one of these crazy stories from my life that the the ed teacher which is like emotionally disturbed kids basically like mental illness of some sort or like neurodivergency of some sort including all kinds of neurodivergency my mom did that as a job the ed teacher at my middle school was friends with her and it like knew me and knew me because of seeing me with her and so he would come and like check on me when he wasn't really supposed to because he knew that by that point in school i was getting bullied like relentlessly by like everyone and he knew how my dad was 
And my dad used to show up at my mom's school and they would have to call the police on him. And he worked with her for a little bit at her school. So he knew how bad he was. And so he would just come by at like recess or whatever, or dirt when I would see the guidance counselor and stuff and just ask me how I am and try to talk to me. And he was around when I was in middle school too. And I remember when I was in sixth grade, him getting so mad and being like, why won't you stand up for yourself? <laughs> and because I was letting somebody that treated me like a friend treat me like absolute garbage. Like, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't really bad. It was really bad. Um, like she was a friend of mine and then started bullying me like everybody else. And I just like let her and like, I couldn't explain any of that stuff to them, but th that's the stuff that I remember from those times. And it's, a hor like a beyond horrible feeling to be like everyone's life would be better if I wasn't here. And that's essentially what those scenes with Percy are, which is why I can't watch them because that's one of those things that it's so hard to know that. And like it's hard when you know that and it's not like purely trauma. It's literally factually true. Like if Percy wasn't here right now, his mom's life would be better. His mom wouldn't be living with an abusive husband. His mom wouldn't be having to deal with all of these schools and is and dealing with him, feeling like he's the source of all of her problems. Like Sally is a great teach, uh, teacher, parent in the way that Annabeth's dad is not. And so he she never blames him for any of this stuff. But it's absolutely true. And that's just his story in like the Greek world or whatever that everyone always tells him that everything would be much better if he wasn't here. Like the prophecy wouldn't happen if he wasn't here. And like all these people who die because of the prophecy would still be a lot if he wasn't here. And like with me, it was purely like my parents got married because of me. My mom got pregnant with me because, and that's the only reason they got married. And so when I figured that out, when I was 12, that like became a really horrible thing in my mind like i just kept thinking like i can't complain about any of this because this family exists because of me and mm -hmm. i literally had to do emdr over that mm -hmm. and so like it's a hor it's it's i don't even know how to explain how bad that feeling is when you when as much as people want to say but that's not true you're like but it is true like don't tell me that it's not like, it is absolutely true that things would have been better in my mom's life if he didn't, she didn't have to marry my dad. It would have been better in Sally's life. She didn't get pregnant with somebody like Percy and have to deal with all this stuff instead got to live her own life. And it's not all Percy's fault. Like, it's not actually my fault, but you still feel responsible for it. And it, <laughs> those scenes are just so hard because yeah. there's nothing Sally can do. Yeah, like we see them all from Percy's perspective until Sally walks away to go like pay, but she actually lights that match and and dumps it in the shake um, for Poseidon. And um, yeah, we kind of, I don't know, it's so interesting that they did it that way, that they made it like very much, you see what Percy sees, you see him saying, I would never, I would never put you away somewhere and like you know as a mom like as a mom that would be so fucking hard like when your kid mm -hmm. calls you out it hits extra hard because like you, you know they they don't have the same like um the same complications in their brain when when they think of situations and so mm -hmm. for sally it's like well i can't tell him i have to gaslight him because if i start telling him he's gonna know and more monsters are gonna come out um but i also don't want him to be scared so i don't want to validate that there's monsters to begin with and like um you know it's she's put in a very very hard situation and it's mm -hmm. not until she breaks down and has to talk to poseidon that like we're like oh shit, she's not just being mean she understands him and she wants things to be better but she's stuck yeah she's absolutely stuck like she if she doesn't want him to go to camp when he's however old he was like eight or nine in those scenes then she has to get him in these schools where he hates his life and is treated really badly every single day like every time i watch i do watch the part where poseidon and sally talk to each other 
that's like the one scene of these that I actually watch. And it, like when Poseidon says like he'll learn things at the school that you can't teach, I always think, yeah, he's gonna learn to hate himself. <laughs> like yeah. that's what he learns in these schools. And so whenever I watch this, part of me just wants to like jump through the screen and be like, just let him go to fucking camp. <laughs> like he's eight years old. He's old enough by this point to have an idea of who he is. Like it's that whole balance of like, is it really worth it for him not to go to camp all these years? If the years that he's in school, he's told every single day that he's a bad person and and like doing something wrong when he's not even doing anything, he's just existing. Like, is it really worth it for him to think that he's hallucinating for like six solid years of his life and feeling like he has to hide that from everybody because he is afraid that they're going to send him to some mental institution or something if he tells them. And, and then also be ostracized by everybody at school and all that kind of stuff because he's neurodivergent in multiple ways. Um, it's, and then on top of it, when he does go home and see his mom, Gabe is there. Yeah. And so it's like, it's just like relentless. And it's like, is that really, what is, it's like, what is like the toss up here? Like, is it worth it for him to go to school and learn that he's a bad person and hide everything who he is and be afraid that he's secretly like broken and then go home and be told to his face that he is wrong and bad by Gabe and get hit by him. Um, or, or to go to a camp where he might like be exposed to an abusive family, but, but also is that worse than the abuse that he's experiencing right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, this is an, a thing that I feel like I struggle with as a mother too, is like, I understand where Sally is coming from when she says, I want him to know who he is before your family can tell him who they want him to be. And learn that he's a bad person and hide everything who he is and be afraid that he's secretly like broken and then go home and be told to his face that he is wrong and bad by Gabe and get hit by him. Um, or, or to go to a camp where he might like be exposed to an abusive family, but but also is that worse than the abuse that he's experiencing right now? <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, this is an, a thing that I feel like I struggle with as a mother too, is like, I understand where Sally is coming from when she says, I want him to know who he is before your family can tell him who they want mm -hmm. him to be. I, I so get that because, you know, especially raising a boy who, you know, at least so far identifies with his gender and um, realizing that the world is going to want him to be harder. The world is going to want him to not be so sensitive, to not um, to not be as interested in some of the things he's interested in or um, not to take as much joy in life as I want him to. And that is a hard reality to know. Once I get out there, there's not going to be all this love and support he has at home. But yeah, that also, what love and support is Sally providing if she is sending him off to places that are treating him like he's a problem? Yeah. Um, that's where that's where I kind of lose my empathy for Sally a, a bit. Is like. I understand what you're saying and where you're coming from, but you're not with him every day. You're not reinforcing the values you want him to have every day in the same way that you would be maybe if she chose homeschooling in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, that's the part where I get like mad at Sally and I then go on like, I find fan fiction of where they get mad at Sally. <laughs> that's the only like outlet for things like that because i get so i get so mad hearing her like it's this weird thing that like she's basically being the enabler in like in a dysfunctional family system she's like forced to be that person but that still is what she's doing like percy only gets to see her when gabe is around and mm -hmm. so it's like, I get why she's around Gabe because the I understand why she thinks that like Percy is this 
wonderful just child and monsters go after him because you can say because he has a lot of power but it's that whole thing of like the whole thing we've been talking about about treating the myths like they're real like the reason why all of the heroes also act like abused kids is because heroes were abused that's not like a funny happenstance they're the same and so he acts like a hero and it, the only way she can imagine covering up somebody being that like purely good is by finding somebody who is horrible to try to cover that up so that people so that monsters don't realize what a good person Percy is before he's old enough to like protect himself from them. But at the same time, it's like you're doing all this stuff to protect him from the monsters outside of his house. What about the monster in his house that like did arguably more damage to him <laughs> like yeah. even within like the stories we go through like the house of hades book when they go into tartarus and they fall in there he tartarus smells like gabe to him the entire time they're down there like he his personification of literal hell is his stepdad and yeah. there's like other things like that that prop up during the books that where he gets reminded of Gabe and remembers him and those things and just like his lack of self-worth like he's this huge hero and everybody idolizes him and he has absolutely no idea why like he, he doesn't he's like I'm in like when he's like I'm an idiot I'm lucky that Annabeth is here to save me all the time while everybody else is like holy shit this dude is so powerful that I'm actually scared standing next to him right now because of how good he is at all of this. What the fuck am I doing? He just made a hurricane. I'm going to go like cry myself to sleep. <laughs> and he's sitting there saying that he's like a failure. And so it's like, it's one of those things I can't, I have to say that because of my upbringing, I have to point that out of like, did it really pay off? Like, did it really help? forcing him to be with somebody like Gabe who was hitting him like for many years of his life and the only time he got to see his mom was if he had to be somewhere in the same place with the dude that was hitting him and just treating him really badly and so it's like at least after Gabe is gone he the only reason Percy doesn't stay at camp all the time is because he just wants to see his mom yeah. And so at least after that happens, he has his mom and then he has Paul, who is a wonderful person um, mm -hmm. and has like an actual good person living with him. But for the first 12 years, that's like the toss up. And even if it ends after 12 years, there's a lot of damage <laughs> from that. And I'm and it's OK to like look at Sally and be like, I know you're in a possible position, but also I'm not really sure that this was like exactly the best way to handle all of this. Yeah, well, I mean, that's been the question I've been talking about in therapy because mm -hmm. it's easy to blame the parent that was there to make mistakes. And, you know, like we've talked about how with Poseidon, it's like anytime Poseidon bothers to show up or even helps him through proxy, Percy is like, oh, maybe he is good, you know, like it's. Um, these little like tricklings of love from Poseidon feel so great, e even though he's been neglectful. And I'm sure there's some version of Percy that as an adult is going to question, like, did Sally have to make this choice or this choice or this choice? Um, and I, what I can say for Sally more than my mom is I, I do feel like she'll be able to like, you know what? maybe you're right i saw through the mist i knew you were being chased by monsters and i gaslit you and that's kind of shitty um but uh it's it's kind of true she's the one who's there so it's easy to get mad at her yeah and it's also a thing of i think that sally would be one that would listen to percy being upset about stuff like that and would be okay with him being upset with her about stuff like that of being like maybe and it's also one of those hard things of like because the way that the books are written from Percy's perspective uh, I honestly don't even know if Sally knows that like Gabe was hitting him um yeah because he wouldn't have wanted to tell Sally that and he didn't know that Gabe was hitting Sally too 
like Gabe lied to him and told him that if he put if he let him hit him that he wouldn't hit his mom um that they never actually do that though um so it's one of those things of like they were both trying to protect each other from that horrible person and neither one of them were actually being protected from any of it and mm -hmm. it is one of the things that i like a lot about percy throughout the entire series of all the different books and stuff is that like poseidon is nicer to him than some of the other like poseidon kids or whatever or some of the other kids that he knows at camp and stuff um but he's still never like that nice to him and percy doesn't like li almost expect anything at all from him mm -hmm. um like there's never a point when he expects him to be there he's like surprised when he is there um and so he gets like hardly anything from him and there's like little things like when he's in a battle situation or something like that he he knows that he can call on his dad to, if he needs it to like help them get out of something and things like that like i haven't actually read the chalice of the gods book but i know that there's at least a part in that book where they have they they need something something i don't know what from poseidon and he like stands on one of his um uh what are they called not statues um what do they call the arch in st louis what is i can't even think of the word a uh, what an altar yeah or a temple? like a it's like a special thing like that where as soon as he sits on it like poseidon shows up screaming like who is there sitting and he's like oh it's percy and he like stops but he sits on it because he knows that it will get his attention and he'll show up right away because they need something from him but like that's the only time that he really like asks for help with poseidon like and i said this in the, our last live stream but when he's in when they're in tartarus um i forget who somebody that they that is nice to them and there's a couple people that are nice to them in tartarus that help them towards the end and there's somehow one of those people says that they somehow know that poseidon can't like go down there to help them um and maybe it's a bad person that says it to them like mocking him or whatever about how powerful he is but his powerful dad still won't help him but like when he says that like percy doesn't even expect him to like it would obviously be nice because he wants to get out of there but he doesn't expect his dad to do anything like that he doesn't expect him to actually help him and so i don't know what's worse <laughs> like that's really bad no matter what like he doesn't ever expect poseidon to be there so when he gets anything at all he's like pleasantly surprised and then with sally she's the one that was actually there that does love him a lot and um you know treated him much better than some of the other mortal parents treat their kids mm -hmm. but a lot better <laughs> like she's like yeah. the resident mother for a lot of his friends and stuff in the like it's a thing in the books that people go to sally's apartment to ask for help um even when percy isn't there <laughs> yeah <laughs> because she's like somebody that the kids at camp can go to that they trust and so like she is a very good parent but at the same time it's like this is all just like so horrible that what do you do yeah yeah and william like um so I, like if you want to get an idea luke in the first season of the lightning thief is 19. yeah that's that's how old sally was when she got pregnant with percy and had him yeah, yes. so like my my mom friend, I'm pretty sure she was like 18, 19 when she had her daughter. And like also my best friend in a high school was 18 when she had her son. So like they there's definitely a lot of mistakes you make when you were that young as a mom, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have help, um, because being a mom is expensive, number one, like to get all of the right equipment to get all of the best things for your kid. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and kids like for the first year, they run through clothes like crazy because they are growing so much. Babies grow. I want to say it's something like 300 times their size in the first year. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the idea of her doing all of that alone, it just, I get it. I get why she made mistakes. I get, you know, like that, 
she really, really didn't have anything. And I just can't help but feel bad for her. I just, I don't know, like, I would be so tempted to tell my kid what's actually going on rather than gaslighting them. And maybe that's mm -hmm. part of my trauma. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, you know, part of my, like, I don't have as many boundaries. And I had to learn how to have boundaries as a mom kind of thing. But I would have a lot of trouble, you know, like watching my kid basically, you know, be afraid of something and like that thing be real, but telling them, no, it's not real. Um, like, yeah, I feel I, like, I feel like, um, I feel like my own mom did that with me, like by like, she knew how bad things had been but my brain didn't all the time a lot of the time i didn't because it blocked all of it out or most of it out um so it's like do i go out of the way to bring this up with my daughter that was already like outrageously struggling <laughs> um like i was all the all the time especially before I mean, I never really stopped, <laughs> like, to be fair. And there wasn't really ever a time where things suddenly got better. So it's like, I was always struggling with a million things. And so like, do you go out of your way to tell your kid that's already struggling something like that, even if you think they should know, knowing that that's going to automatically make their life worse, or you just kind of let them be like oblivious in that way or hope that they are so that you can think that maybe one day in the future when they're ready they'll be able to handle it better um but then of course when that does happen we feel very like betrayed that that other person definitely knew things and they like didn't do anything about it or like didn't bring it up with us or didn't do more <sighs> it's just like an impossible choice like do you tell your kid who they are and then have to like take get them taken away from you basically or do you or do you not tell them who you are but also damage their psyche a lot by putting them through that it's like there's no good answer to any of that yeah and to, like i mean there we know from my case there is a such thing as too much information like did my mom think my dad was a danger and that's why she told us every single detail of like their divorce and why they broke up and stuff maybe but was my dad going to cheat on me like what why did i need to know he cheated on you you know like what no. does that matter to me as his child we're not in a romantic relationship <laughs> um, and my dad did that stuff too he tried to he tried to like say whatever he could to try to make us oh, not like my mom like I forgot about this, but my mom and I were talking about my dad the other day and she was reminding me that after they got divorced, he tried to make it sound like she was like a drug addict <laughs> before they met it. She wasn't at all like she smoked some pot or whatever with like her like she was 27 when she had me. So mm -hmm. um, she had like they had friends that she knew from college that she would smoke pot with every once in a while. Um, and she immediately stopped doing that when she got pregnant with me and just like never really started after she had me. Um, but, but like he tried to make it sound like she was like this deviant person. And I was like, I don't believe anything you say. So, <laughs> so I didn't believe it. My that's sister like, did, but that's like that's mom was probably a young adult in the seventies, right? Like yeah. it checks yeah, like, out. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that like he did other things like that too but and that's like absolutely always the wrong thing to do like you're you're making me feel like i have to choose and i'm never going to choose you because you're making me do this <laughs> automatically i'm not going to choose you because you are putting me in this position um but it's hard especially when you're the younger sibling like you were to um i guess have enough contact when you're not the scapegoat i guess is what i'll say is it's hard when you're not the scapegoat to realize um that this person is obviously trying to manipulate you because you're you don't have to worry about that necessarily as much like overtly like in the ways that scapegoats do and so it's hard that i don't know it's just it's really hard to have to be put in the middle like that
and you like shouldn't be and even with percy that somewhat happened with gabe because gabe with his freaking gambling mm-hmm. would make him like get him like beer from the fridge and would like yell at him in front of everybody if he did it wrong and would and like percy was working jobs when he was like a tiny little kid because gabe would make him give him money and if he didn't give him money he would punch him in the face and sometimes yeah, he, he says in the book that when he comes some of the summer he'll have to have a job and, yeah, and that's like, why, because gabe called it like I forget he called it like man money or something like that like basically like this is just between me and you don't tell your mom about it and if you tell your mom about it i'm gonna beat you up and he beat him up anyway but um <laughs> stuff like that just makes me like whoever did this to rick Riordan, you better be fucking dead <laughs> because yeah. that's like the kind of like dynamic stuff that happens in these sort of dysfunctional situations like that is way too accurate to not be something that he actually experienced <laughs> just, yeah, like, just saying that back, like you're a man so you have to pay your way yeah like you're um, a man like me and so you have to go out and like give me money because i'm a because so, i'm like a bigger man and and just the idea that he would go to schools like that like those academies and come home and not be able to just like relax and like you know, Sally tried to let him be a kid sometimes, but he couldn't really ever relax because he would have to go out and not only get a job when he was a little kid, but also hide it from his mom yeah. so that he wouldn't find out what he was doing. So who the freak knows what he was doing But to get that money? He did something, but... Well, didn't he um, say, like, newspaper and walking dogs, I think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Stuff he could so- do when his mom was at work, basically? Yeah, um, exactly. So, this kid was, uh, I mean, Jake used to hustle like that as a teen or as a young kid from the sounds of it, where it'd be like, he'd put up flyers around the neighborhood saying he'll rake people's leaves or things yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, so I could see Percy being resourceful like that of like, well, he wants money from me. I'm going to make money. I'll figure out a way. Um, yeah, one of those little things I always notice is when Grover or he's talking about meeting Grover in the, like the very first chapter of the book. And he talks about how he's like selling candy bars out of his room at school to get money. And I'm like, yeah, that's the exact like hyper independent kid that's been on their own forever. Um, and is like, I need to get money in order to like buy food, I'm assuming since he was a little boy. <laughs> and this is the way that I can do it. So I'm just gonna like hustle people. I'm gonna hustle the rich people at my school and get them to give me money so that I can survive because otherwise I'm not going to have anything. That's that's like part of the hard stuff with Sally is that when she was there, she was a, like a support system, but she wasn't there the majority of the time. And so even though he has a great mom, he has all of the like hyper independence stuff going on anyway because she physically wasn't around most of the times so he was on his own anyway. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's part that I feel like I'm wrestling with my therapy journey is that some of the things that my mom did were very well-meaning. And sometimes she was a pretty good mom. Like, I, I do have to admit that. And you have to admit that about Sally sometimes, too. Mm-hmm. Um, like, we do see the, um, the moral compass that she gives Percy come out with in the show, at least, in how he leaves Hades, where he repeats, mm-hmm. like, one of her lines to her. Um, crap, I forget what what it was. She said, like, he says, hold fast, mom. Like, mm-hmm. but he also says something else that was a callback from, like, one of those scenes in the car. And, um, can't remember it now. But that's the kind of thing that you hope for as a mom, that you hope when I am not here, my kid is presenting those same values that yeah, like, I, yeah, I like the, the whole, like, trip, he, the only reason he goes trip the only reason he goes on the quest is because he wants to get his mom back and then in the course of it he starts caring actually about what's going on and either way like when they all go down there in the show and the book they're all very like focused on no we're getting your mom back and we're not leaving here without her that that whole thing um and then when he actually gets down there and they could bring her back he has to he has to leave her there and just hope that Hades will give him back to her. Like, that's the whole, like, hero thing of Sally did somehow get good 
like morals and ethics and things like that into him despite all of this craziness because he did in the end when it really came down to it he did the hero thing like he left her there at the end of the season like when he's leaving camp after the whole like luke fight and stuff he like tells chiron that he's like i'm just gonna go quick and if she's not there i'm gonna come back because he doesn't know if hades is gonna give him his mom back and so he just is hoping that he will and he obviously does but he could have just said no to him and he still like took the chance anyway because it's the right thing to do and like that's the person that sally wanted him to be that's who he is he still somehow ended up like that because sally is a like generally a good mom but it's part of the whole like complexity of raising another person that no matter how much you try to do the right thing or sometimes things are just out of your control or just things happen especially if you don't know that they're happening (laughs) and there's and even when you do know they're happening, they can happen and you you can try to do the best you can, but there's only so much you can really do to stop any of this. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's a really rough place to be, you know, in kind of in charge of setting that moral compass for somebody who has a strong sense of justice, somebody mm-hmm. who's neurodivergent, because it could go really wrong. It can go really, really wrong. When you realize that as a mom, you have this power <laughs> like it's it's almost a superpower that like sometimes the moral compass things that you say to try to direct their compass they actually stick when you don't realize they are and then you hear them repeat it back like it's it's a weighty responsibility it's a really weighty one and like with percy having so much responsibility um having to be the person who's going to save the world oh my gosh like because you know there there is a part of me that fears like as a mom one of my real life fears one of my real life monsters for my kid is a school pew pew you know like and i i kind of feel sometimes that the kid that i raised would be one who would try to storm them who would be trying to like run after them and try to save people and that scares the shit out of me you know Mm -hmm. I like one of the things that I love to think about is um, when it comes to this world is like, how much does Sally know about the quest that Percy goes on? Because there's no way that he actually tells her everything that happened. There is absolutely no way that he does that because and even if he did, it would be his like very warped, like self-worth is like negative 20 version he would talk up everybody else and downplay what he actually did or make it or say the things that he does in like a very nonchalant way and some of the things that happens particularly going forward are so scary and like it's wild for me to like rethink about these scenes now as like somebody who's now been in therapy for six years (laughs) when I hadn't been in any at all when I read all of these books and especially when I'm older like this that this is like a child like Percy could be my literal child because of how young he is just thinking about how when he's like 14 he gets so scared of monsters attacking him throwing like lava at him in a volcano and it there the lava is like burning him and he gets so scared that he accidentally makes a a volcano erupt because he just like brings water towards him because his skin is burning and he's scared. And that's how he ends up on like Calypso's Island almost dying for two weeks. And like his time on Calypso's Island for most of it, he can't even stand up or walk because his skin is so messed up. And it's like a miracle that he survived and she like brings him back. And as soon as he's able to like walk around, he's like, okay, I have to go back. And like when he comes back, like he walks into what is supposed to be his funeral because they, he just disappeared for two weeks, but he's like really skinny and still has like burns on him and stuff. There is no way that Sally knows that that happened. Hey mom, I blew up a volcano and almost died. Yeah, like everyone at camp thought that I was dead for two weeks. And it's honestly an absolute miracle that I wasn't dead. And as soon as I got back, I didn't take any time to rest 
or anything like that and immediately went back into the freaking labyrinth and luke almost killed me for the 47th time again after that like that's when they go back in the labyrinth and he's like he's like has like Cronus's eyes and stuff and he like slows down time and it's like another huge miracle that they make it out of that room alive because he literally can't move when he's like freezing time like there's just no way that Sally actually like can you imagine after they fell into Tartarus like Percy coming home and trying to tell her about that like yeah. no <laughs> like I can't and that's just like the stuff that he does, much less the other people that he's friends with that Sally knows that she also cares about. And it's just like in like the fourth book. Yeah, the end of the fourth book, Nico just shows up at his house mm -hmm. <laughs> and is just like, hello, I just spent the last book and a half trying to kill you, but I'm here now <laughs> on his birthday. And he just shows up there and he's obviously a super traumatized kid. And he is. Um, but it's just she sees these kids going through the hardest stuff all the time and she has to know that there's so many things going on that she doesn't actually know about and that yeah. the things that she hears about are probably like i just think about myself like they were like part of um me and my mom's dynamic right now like uh i was no contact with my mom for five years and last july we started talking again um almost every time i see her um, I end up telling her the truth about something that I lied to her about. <laughs> and she's like, I was telling her about last time. Um, that you had friends in college. Was yes. that one? Of them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, and I also lied, I kind of doubly lied to her because I told her the truth that I didn't have any friends in college and nobody liked me in college still. And I just acted like they did. And I still kind of lied to her because I didn't tell her why. <laughs> um, but still like I, I do, there's stuff like that that happens all the time. Or like the other day I told her, um, she was for some reason talking about the time when I was in first grade that, um, that she thought that the school put me on the wrong bus. And I was like, no, that was me. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, I got on the wrong bus on purpose because I didn't want to go with dad's parents. I don't know why I didn't want to go with my grandparents that day, but like, I just didn't want to. And I just got on the wrong bus. I knew it was the wrong bus and I didn't care. And she was like, what? <laughs> and so like, I can like understand where Annabeth is coming from because I was seven when I did that. And I literally was just like, I didn't, I don't even care that I don't know where I'm going. And I'm basically trying to run away without meaning to and i knew that and my parents my like my my mom especially my mom at least was scared when i did that and they and my grandparents definitely were um and i just lied and i told them that it was that the school just assumed that they did something wrong with me because they don't want to believe that a seven-year-old kid would run away on purpose yeah. but it's like that those stuff like stuff like that happened like almost every day <laughs> when i was growing up because my abusive situation was like out of this world and so i just lied to my mom all the time about what was really going on because i knew that she would be upset if she knew and there was nothing that i could do about it um like i remember lying to her when i was in high school too when i had friends about getting along with kids in my class because none of my friends ever had we never had classes together and so i still never had people to like talk to when I went on like road trips or not road trips on field trips and stuff like that. And I just told her that I did. And so it's, it's that stuff. That's like, it's especially with neurodivergent kids. Um, I can talk about me just being, having PTSD and then also aut autistic, the kind of autistic I have is where I have a lot of empathy. Um, so like I knew that there are certain things that were happening that my mom would get upset about. And so I just went out of my way to not tell her because I knew that it would upset her. And like, even if she wanted me to tell her and she did, she would try to ask me about stuff and I would just not tell her. I still just like was so aware of how she would feel that I just didn't tell her. And there's, and there's only so much of that that you can really stop your kid from doing especially if they're like aware that something might hurt your feelings. Um, yeah. There's just things that they're not going to say because they don't want to worry you. And it's impossible to stop that from happening. Like you can't, 
you can't make your kid love you and then be like but love love me enough but don't love me enough to not tell me things because <laughs> that's just like part of the whole thing that you don't want the people you love to worry about you so you just you just and especially if there's any time where you feel responsible for other people's feelings um mm -hmm. and basically everyone in percy jackson does at some point or another like every character in it has that sort of weight on them in some way he definitely has it the most but like at some point you have it like that so you're just gonna learn not to like pick and choose what you tell people and especially if you're someone like percy where you're told when you're like you know like seven or something that you're hallucinating and people are like thinking that you might be schizophrenic or something or other whatever they thought he was you learn very quickly that you can't tell like adults mm -hmm. what are going on in your mind so you just don't and you just like I can so clearly remember being in school literally like going through the different things in my head about what I could say when people would ask me questions <laughs> there was yeah. like five different options and I would just pick one based on yeah. my mood <laughs> well and Percy has just enough tools to gaslight her about what happens um because he knows the miss he can very <laughs> easily be like oh yeah I bought Medusa and I used mirrors, so I was fine. Or, um, you know, he could very mm -hmm. easily sanitize them because he's been told these myths by, by Sally. He's been told them by Mr. Brenner. And they both emphasized without telling him he was a demigod, hey, it's important. <laughs> these are life or death myths. And he was just like, okay, <laughs> I'm in Latin class. Yeah. Um, but, well, um, and, and like, yeah. One one dynamic of that too is like um, him and Annabeth is in like the later books. Um, Annabeth like lives in New York, like she lives basically with him. Like um, the the book that is about like Nico and his boyfriend. Um, I was reading like kind of like the synopsis of it because I haven't read the book, but I was curious about what happened in it. And one of the scenes in that book is Nico going to see Sally and, and being like, I need to ask like Percy and Annabeth for like advice. And they're at, they're like at school because um, it's his like senior year. And so they, they just like Iris message them during like their free period at school and talk to, and talk to both of them about something. But it's like, that is something I wonder about, like, that could be interesting <laughs> as more time goes on, because Annabeth actually knows everything that happened and would have a different perspective about certain things than Percy did. And so I feel like her just, like, saying things out loud, Sally will hear something and be like, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> and especially, like, when Percy was missing, um and gone for like six months in like the Hero of Olympus, Olympus books, like Annabeth went and stayed a lot of time at like with Sally um, when he was missing. And so it's like they have a relationship outside of the one that they both have with Percy. And yeah. that's that's honestly probably the best thing for Percy to have somebody like that who might be able to tell talk to his mom about things that he just like, he just can't do it. Yeah. It's just nice to have somebody like that. Um, one thing from this I did want to talk about, though, is how wildly different Hades in the books is versus Hades in the show. I like Hades in the show much more um, because I hated, like, the book version of Hades. And I told you, like, I forgot why I hated him so much because I was like, why would I hate Hades? Like, he seems otherwise fine. And then I re-listened to this scene and I was like, oh, this is why I hated him. <laughs> yeah. And I like held that grudge against that character forever. Cause I was like, why don't I like him? I'm like, this is why, this is why I hated him. Cause like book Hades is literally like a scapegoat's worst nightmare. He is trying to be intimidating on purpose. He's threatening to attack them. He makes an earthquake happen because he's so angry. But the main thing that is the most outrageously triggering like it I was glad that I listened to it at like eight o'clock this morning and could just like be like triggered slash rationally upset for like five hours before we did this because I was like actually like 
like triggered, like actually triggered by listening to that because I was just like, oh my God, I'm remembering this now when I first read this, this book, how upsetting this was because he is, it's so triggering when you go through that to listen to Hades in the book, literally be so wrapped up in his own bullshit. Like he is so angry at his family that it makes him stupid that and it, that's such like a scapegoated kid thing like i like i remember very vividly feeling like everyone around me was a fucking idiot growing up for like most of life especially when I, before i like moved out um because it was just so obvious to me what was going on or like certain situ i still have that like on social media when like influencers are exposed and i'm like why didn't you realize this like two years ago when they said this thing and it was obvious that something like this was going on like why did i get mad like why do you need victims to like be hurt in order for you to take it seriously those those things that always tend to happen and it's that whole feeling and book hades is so mad at his brothers that he's just ranting and raving at Percy and being like, you stole my helm and you stole the lightning bolt. It's in your backpack, which like, granted it is, but he doesn't know that, but still he's like so wrapped up in it. And it's like, if you would think for three seconds about what you're saying, you would realize that none of it makes any sense. Like mm -hmm. he's 12. He didn't even know that he was a demigod when this happened. You're just assuming that it's him because you want to be mad at your brother. And yeah. I am like intimately aware of what it's like when family people hold you responsible for things because they don't like the person that brought you into the world. It's mm -hmm. horrible. Like I didn't do anything. I'm just yeah. here. <laughs> and like, you're screaming at me and uh, like threatening to kill me and threatening to do all of these horrible things to me. And you're not even like listening to the words that I'm saying because you want me to be somebody that I'm not. And you can't even like stop talking for three seconds or even just think about what you're saying. Like what he says in the book doesn't even make logical sense. And like the show version of Hades also does that. Like the show version of Hades sends the Furies to kill him at school when he has no idea what's going on. Like it would take three seconds for him to figure out that per that Percy was never there. Like at the, the winter solstice thing that he couldn't, if he's like sitting there terrified when Electo is killing him or trying to kill him, he obviously doesn't know anything. Yeah. Like, that would be the point when you would stop pretending <laughs> and he never stopped pretending because he doesn't actually know, but they just don't want to admit that they're wrong. And it's just like that frustrating feeling of he is threatening all these things and like threatening to not give him back his mom when they use like the pearls in the book, they have to like rush doing it because he doesn't want them to leave. Um, yeah. And they just have to do it really quickly and hope that it works. And it, it's just that whole feeling of like, he doesn't tell him that it's Kronos in the book because he's too afraid of him that he can't tell him that. Mm -hmm. And he's just like that dominating, domineering person that is holding him responsible for things that aren't his fault and trying to be so scary and so angry that he can't even listen to the words that are coming out of his mouth. And it's, I, I just remember so much, so many times of feeling like that, like, will you just stop talking for 10 seconds? So mm -hmm. I can like tell you how much of an idiot you are, <laughs> like nicely, but can I like yeah. at least give me a chance to like say something instead of just immediately believing that I did all these things because you don't like my dad. <laughs> Yeah, well, so their depiction of Hades in this one, I really got the vibe that they were trying to copy Hercules Hades, that they were trying to make him a little bit more sarcastic and funny and um, like almost a Tony Stark-esque personality with, you know, the ties to wealth and I'm just going to be a sarcastic asshole. Um, but I think it bears acknowledging that Hades is a bit of a scapegoat himself, but he's like the bitter version. He's the version that does not heal and is ready to like say everybody in the family is shit. And because you are acting on their behalf, you're shit right now too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, he very much doesn't see like these kids don't want to be here. They don't want to be on this mission. He doesn't want to be chasing the master bolt. Like, does not you know didn't know anything weeks before he's not gonna acknowledge any of that because he's like i am the victim yes, i am the victim I am here, the victim here. 
<laughs> you are a child, but I am the victim, the the god that can't die. <laughs> yeah. It's very much that. And I do really appreciate the show version because he is more like jokey and whatever and not like causing earthquakes and like sicking like the furies on them like the book version like the furies are literally like standing there just like waiting for him to let them like eat them and so i'm glad that that whole interaction was much better because i like the fact that the show version percy gets to say out loud to him that chronos is the one that's doing this um because he does figure it out in the book as well um he just doesn't say it out loud but he does figure it out in both places that was one of those weird critiques i saw about the show is like percy is too smart and i'm like okay <laughs> like He's I don't, smart. Yeah. No, no, no 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 like he figured that out in the book i think you're being weirdly ableist towards him and just assuming that he's an idiot because he has dyslexia and but ADHD. Technically doesn't Annabeth too if, yes. if we're the like demigod trait. Yeah. So One I mean one of my with... favorite things actually in the whole series is that there's points where Annabeth doesn't know how to read things either. Like there's a point in like Sea of Monsters where she's trying to say the word Cyclops, but she can't remember it. And she's trying to spell it, but can't spell it either. So she just gets frustrated and she's like, never mind. <laughs> and so it's like, even though that she's really smart, she still also is disabled, everybody. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, well, I so in the way that we see that coming out in the books, if, if I get where you're coming from with this, is when um annabeth is saying oh it has to be hades even though she's recognizing his dream is about tartarus like she's very much realizing oh shit, he's dreaming of tartarus it could be oh wait no it has to be hades like she stops herself from even thinking it could yeah, be she's too scared somebody she's, tartarus. she's too scared of the idea that it's chronos because she yeah. knows how scary chronos is percy is like you know the new person in this world so he and I don't know. It's also just like a way that you think sometimes, like the neurodivergent side of it, of it all. Like this is how, like at least my neurodivergent brain works. Is that I feel like this is like an effect of having like a very chaotic home life. Is that you just once you realize like this is obviously the answer, even if it's a horrible answer, you're not gonna like pretend like it's not that because you're used to like bad things happening. And so he's like, yeah, it's obviously Kronos. And so I'm just going to talk about it because I'm used to bad things happening. So I'm just going to talk about it now instead of trying to convince myself that it's, you know, Hades or somebody else. Like, no, it has to be, it has to be this guy. <laughs> it has to be the most evil being because who else would do something like this? Um, yeah, we I see think... him probably in the books, like, what if it's not Hades? But like, mm -hmm. if it's not Hades, who is it? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and he hasn't like completely put it together yet who it is. And then when he, when he's in the underworld, he pretty much realizes like, oh, that's, that's who that was because that was Tartarus. Like that because it, they're not sure, like where what that was at first, and then they realize what it is, and they're like, oh, that was Tartarus that we tried to get that tried to suck us into it, or tried to suck Rover into it. So that's what that was and so if that's tartarus then that has to be chronos obviously because he's the person in tartarus who else would it be and it's literally just like logic of there's no other option now that i know that that giant hole in the ground was tartarus um i like that when that happens in the show that hades immediately is like it like accept me letting you stay here because i will protect you from this scary person that is that is in your dreams trying to tell you to kill everyone mm -hmm. and so it's like he's all like sarcastic and has a bunch of attitude for him he sends the furies after him in this season but as soon as he realizes that chronos is coming back he's like give me the master bolt <laughs> because i need something powerful if chronos is going to come out of that fucking hole in the underworld that's here and also like I will protect you from him and I'll even protect your nice guilt friend from him because I know how scary he is. And they're like, no, we're going to leave. Bye. Yep. <laughs> and, but it's nice to show like the show version is because it's not so crazy. Um, and like overly aggressive in that way, he's able to see that Hades is Hades, but he still will protect him from 
something that is that dangerous that even Hades is like, okay, you actually are a child though, and you probably shouldn't die. Yeah. <laughs> even if it's just because your dad will be really mad at me if I let you die down here. Um, I mean, I, I like to think at least show Hades is impressed that he got down there because mm -hmm. I mean, they, they skip over that a little bit with how fast they moved through the underworld, mm -hmm. but it's not easy as a mortal to get into the underworld. Charon does not want to take you on his ship and every step of the way, people are going to realize you're alive and like either you're going to have shades coming after you and asking for your help or you're going to have Kerberos like Cerberus like attacking you or you know like I yeah, don't know he's so like oh that was easy and they're like easy <laughs> yeah. like excuse me that like, was not like, like the red ball thing, but like they're for, in the book, Percy's first plan with with him doesn't work. Where he has a broken chair leg, he uses as like a stick. Mm -hmm. It's and and it is Annabeth who does it. It is Annabeth who was like, oh, I have this red ball that I saved from Denver, but um, it, I don't know, like. It, they don't show exactly how hard that was, and I think that mm -hmm. that's why. That's a good reason why Hades would be inclined to be like, okay, let me keep you on my side because if you think of the heroes who made it there and back, there is something special about them. Orpheus was really good at music. Hercules was very strong. Houdini is somebody who um, Rick Riordan says went to Hades and back. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. One thing, with, one thing with these books that is 